It's, um, we, we really set the stage with the first two speakers, and I'm excited to hear our next uh, uh, sets of speakers. Um, I, I'm uh, proud to uh, introduce Dwayne Irwin, President and CEO of Aspirus Incorporated. I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Dwayne since he joined Aspirus in 2006 as President and CEO. He came to us from uh, Parkview Health Systems in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where he served as the president. Dwayne has a unique background as he is an attorney and also an, an executive uh, in the American, uh, Healthcare, American Academy of uh, Healthcare Executives. It's been truly exciting watching the Aspirus organization as it's continued to grow and evolve in this marketplace. Uh, and we, we've seen the Aspirus brand, they've gone through a branding process and the Aspirus brand becoming a household term over the, in a very short period of time under uh, Dwayne's leadership. Uh, assisting Dwayne uh, in his present today, presentation today is Gene Bergner, Vice President of Post-Acute Aspirus Hospital Care. Uh, she's also the President of VNA and also uh, the President of Aspirus Extended Services Incorporated. She serves as the Executive Champion in the development of Aspirus Telehealth. Gene and I participate in a number of community organizations together and I really enjoy working with Gene. Please welcome uh, both uh, Gene and Dwayne. Thank you all uh, for the applause. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, participate in this, uh, the, this panel. I have to tell you, I'm somewhat, and so is Gene, somewhat uh, humbled by the other panel presenters. Um, you know, we're not exactly the global company as some of the others, and I can tell you, I can't tell you what I did on my last trip to Paris or Australia. I can tell you what I did on my last trip to uh, Ironwood or Hurley or uh, Houghton Hancock. Um, but anyway, it's hope, we're hopeful that uh, some of the lessons that we have learned in our growth journey at Aspirus uh, might be relevant and, and are relevant in a really global economy. What we want, want to cover today are some healthcare trends, uh, the importance of developing a change adaptive culture, talk a little bit about, about what is telehealth. You might consider that one of the next best things to, uh, to happen into the healthcare arena. And then what are we doing about telehealth at Aspirus? But again, why are we presenting on the topic of positioning in a, uh, to compete in a global economy? Healthcare really has been traditionally provided on a local and regional basis. Um, if you go back maybe 10, 15 years, it was almost exclusively on a local basis. Uh, it's now moving more towards, towards regional. Um, because size is becoming increasingly important within the healthcare arena. With the complexity of healthcare, the regulations, uh, the expense and cost of IT structures, infrastructure, uh, a certain size and scope of the organization is, is essential to be successful moving forward into the future. So you see a lot of organizations moving regional. Regionally, there are, are more organizations that are moving um, into the national scene. You have organizations like uh, Healthcare of America, Kaiser, which are really taking a, a position beyond uh, the region but more in the state. And very few are moving uh, globally at this point. You have uh, UPHC, University of Pittsburgh uh, Healthcare, which interestingly enough, uh, focused in Pittsburgh, has just kind of leaped over the East Coast and acquired a hospital over in Europe. So you see a little bit of that going on, but it traditionally has been local and regionally, and the focus tends to be regional at this point in time. Also, um, there is some medical tourism going on, and you might uh, be aware of that, where folks are traveling over to India for uh, various heart care procedures, health care procedures, uh, less costly. But again, that has been fairly limited. It has not uh, taken off to the extent that I think a lot of people had expected it to do. Uh, there is some going on within the, in the United States. There are some, a few insurance products which are being promoted to package high value, which is high quality, lower cost care, uh, so people can travel within the United States and, and receive the high quality care at a lower cost. Aspirus does participate in uh, some of those ventures in the, within the United States, but again, that has not taken off as, as much as uh, folks may expect. The insurance companies are not traditionally embracing uh, that particular product. So again, it's staying pretty much uh, local, regional. 
Um, we have expanded significantly throughout the region. I'd like to go through some of those, that expansion and change. And again, I think some of the lessons from our growth uh, will be applicable to a global environment. Um, our vi mission statement, or vision statement, used to say um, that we were the provider of choice in north central Wisconsin. Several years ago, about six years ago, the board changed that uh, vision statement to say we're the provider of choice in the communities in which we serve, recognizing the need to expand on a regional basis. And since then, we have expanded up into the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan, and you can see our service area is rather extensive. 17 counties in Wisconsin and upper Michigan serving a population of about 590 some uh, thousand people. So what uh, entities make up the Aspirus Inc. organization? Uh, we have Aspirus Wausau Hospital, which is the tertiary center for our system. And then we have five critical access hospitals. Now when I say critical access hospitals, there are hospitals of 25 beds or less. They consist of Aspirus Antonagon Hospital in Antonagon, Aspirus Grandview Hospital in Ironwood, Memorial Health Center in Medford, Aspirus Keweenaw Hospital in, the, in Keweenaw, and Langland Hospital in Antigo. Other entities throughout our organization include Aspirus Extended Services, which is what Gene is responsible for in addition to Aspirus VNA, Home Health, and Extended Services. Our home care team travels approximately over a, a million miles a year taking care of patients in every uh, county in which we provide services. Aspirus Imaging, Freestanding Imaging Services, Aspirus Stevens Point Surgery Center, Northwood Surgery Center, Pine Ridge Surgery Center. In addition, the fastest growing area of our enterprise is the Aspirus uh, Clinics. Um, if you had looked at this chart six months ago, you would have seen four different corporate entities uh, listed under uh, the clinics. Uh, because of healthcare reform, we have been busy uh, centralizing and, and consolidating those entities. So. All of the employed physicians are now in, are all now employed within Aspirus Clinics Inc. Will position us better to um, uh, contract uh, on a value-based uh, basis for our our patients. Other entities is Aspirus Buildings, Aspirus Network, which is our contracting arm of our organization, the Health Foundation, Wisconsin Valley Health Network, which is a consolidated purchasing center for all of our entities and includes other affiliated organizations which are not uh, owned by Aspirus, uh, such as Bay Area Medical Center in Marionette and Riverview Hospital in uh, Wisconsin Rapids. And then finally, the uh, UP uh, residency program. In addition, there have been a number of changes over the last several years uh, that we have been dealing with as an organization. Stevens Point Clinic and Surgery Center came on board Aspirus Doctors Clinic in Wisconsin Rapids became part of the Aspirus uh, brand, and we opened a new 60,000 square foot medical uh, center down in uh, Wisconsin Rapids. The Pinewood Surgery Center, Northwood Surgery Center, Rylander Clinic up in Rylander. The Heart and Vascular Institute, many of you may be aware of, it used to be the Aspirus Heart Institute. We incorporated the vascular services within that institute as well, providing a more comprehensive continuum of care for our patients. We became a level two trauma center. We started the uh, hel helicopter medical transport services, genetic programming, robotic surgery, and have moved extensively into an electronic medical record field and have consolidated our IT platform uh, across all six entities within the system. So our accounting human resources uh, systems are all the same and we're moving forward on electronic medical record which will be consistent in every entity. So no matter where you go, your medical record can be shared if you have to be transferred within the system. So we've gone through this. What lessons have we learned? You must be change adaptive. Uh, it's absolutely essential, we believe, that we master change. Not any given change, but actually master change itself. We need to take advantage of disruptive technologies and continue to be innovative. I can go back earlier in my career, and I remember when I started at Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, that we, we were going to 
put in place a new claims processing system. Everything was going along quite steadily. And the period of time, well, we took a couple years to get ready for the system to come into place. We implemented it. We uh, slowly got accustomed to it and shut down and started going back into normal operations. Back in the 70s, that was like a major change. And you go through like one of those every six, seven, eight years. And what happens when you go through a major change like that? This is the productivity. Whoops. Your productivity, you're sailing along, everybody's doing fine, you enter into the actual implementation of that change, your productivity drip drops, slowly will pick back up if you don't get stuck uh, in the change. It'll slowly pick back up and hopefully it'll be a little bit higher than it was before you entered, entered the process, otherwise why would you, would you have made the change? Now, I think you would all agree, well let me ask you a question. In your organizations, in your workplace, or in your personal lives, how many of you have been through a major change in the last year? Okay. Now that could be a consolidation, a merger, a uh, sale of your organization, new IT systems, um, new boss, new ideas. Well, can think of all the potential changes. All right, now hands back up. You've all been through that change, right? One. How many through two? Three. Four. This is our new reality. Um, change. Keep pressing the wrong button. We're seeing more and more change. The cycles are shorter and, and they overlap. And what happens with the productivity? It's just constantly cycling. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, it's just, it's an ongoing process that, and if you look at Aspirus, um, we had a consult, you know, we acquired four new hospitals in the last four years. We've consolidated different entities within the organization. We have new regulations uh, coming out of Washington and Wisconsin, declining reimbursement, all the issues that we need to manage, major, major changes. And what happens when you go through a change like that? You lose, with its overlapping periods of change now, you lose the luxury of time, you lose closure, and satisfaction goes down. I'm sure you've all been in some of these changes in your organizations where they just don't feel satisfied about their job anymore. And when you're a service industry like Aspirus, which is dedicated to meeting the needs of its patients, you need to have a satisfied workforce. You need to be able to master that change, not the change itself. And you need to be able to manage the depth and duration of that drop in productivity because they're now overlapping. And again, as we look at many of these changes that we've gone through, and, and, in, and in, a, in anticipation of those changes, we knew that we needed to anchor change adaptability into the culture. It was the only way we'd be able to continue to move forward given the environment. Part of our mantra, and you will see it written on our strategic plan, you will see it in many of our communications, is the change is here to stay. The pace of change that you're experiencing today will be the slowest pace of change you will ever experience for the rest of your life. The pace of change you're experiencing today will be the slowest pace of change that you will ever experience for the rest of your life. And change happens not because I say it in our organization, it happens because of three things, technology, information, and people. Technology changes, information changes, it's coming at us at a much more rapid pace every day. We heard about the, talked about that earlier today. And people change, politicians change, bosses change, your customer changes, their expectations are higher. All those changes are forced on us, they're external, they're not internal. So you need to communicate constantly that change is here to stay, and it's being driven by external forces and explain what those forces are. Secondly, second guarantee, it will not be trouble free. Um, you know, when you go through changes, I can remember years ago when we go through these big major changes, that it'll be okay, don't worry about it, you're gonna love it. That's not the case. You go through any of these major changes and they're not trouble free. 
issues will crop up as you go through, the, go through those major changes. Something that may come up that's unanticipated, timelines may change, budgets may change, the economy may change. You have to anticipate and know that it will not be trouble-free. And thirdly, you are accountable. Every individual in our organization is accountable for how they work themselves through that change process. We have the responsibility as management to provide the information that they need, the technology, the opportunity for training, but they're responsible to utilize that information, to go to that training. It's not my responsibility to move them through the, train, the change process. Management's job is not to make everybody happy. Management's job is to move people through the change process and hold everybody accountable. A couple phrases of resistance as you move through the change process. Everybody goes through this. You have betrayal. How could they do this to me? How could they, how, I, I've been doing this for 15 years and everything has been great. How could they do this? I've been trained to do this. And you have denial. Oh, it'll, it'll go away. It won't happen. We've stopped it once, we can stop it again. Oh, I've been through three bosses. I, I've trained all of them. You've all, you've all heard these things. Then finally, uh, identity crisis. Well, what about me? What does this mean to me? And then finally, search for solutions. Well, maybe if I learn to do this, or maybe if I talk to somebody, or what if we change the, you know, this part of the process and make it a little bit better? That will enable you. And everybody goes through those stages, and you have to help people move through that as quickly as possible. And how do you do that? Betrayal. You have to share. In, in, uh, information that's informative. Same with denial. Be informative. Tell them what it means, why you have to do it, why the change is happening, what's driving the change. Identity crisis, start to be supportive. Well, we can, we can help you with that. We'll provide you with the training. And finally, search for solutions. That's when you're inspirational. And the problem that mo most organizations have is that everybody goes through this change process. Leadership, even when we say, okay, we need to make this, this change, we'll go through this. I've, I've sat with my management team and I've gotten into these conversations, well, what does this mean for me? Does that mean I won't have my job anymore? Or who's going to report to me? So we all go through this. And what's interesting is when you start to roll out the change, by that point, management has already worked its way through it. So they're, they're searching for solutions and they want to be inspirational. So you're rolling out a new change, and you go out to the organization, this is going to be great, it's going to be the best thing you've ever experienced, and they're sitting there in betrayal going, I can't believe they're doing this to me. There's a tendency to communicate at the stage that you're in as opposed to the stage of the person you're communicating to. So always be cognizant of your audience and where they are. And sometimes you're in a large audience of people and everybody may be in different stages. So you need to communicate, be informative first, be supportive and be inspirational. Share all three messages, but start with that informative. Otherwise, the people in betrayal will be turned off even more and so will those in denial. So we really focus on this when we've gone through uh, computer changes, we've gone through mergers, we've gone through divestitures of some of our services, we have new people coming into the organization and try to be cognizant of this at all times. If we had not, we would not have been able to work through all the many changes we have and the growth of our service area. At Aspirus, it is a new day. And I, put, I had to put the just in there. It's just another new day. We have to deal with health care reform. We're dealing with the development and formation of accountable care organizations. Medicare, Medicaid spending cuts, aging population, increased utilization by that aging population. At the same time, we're being going to be incentive to keep people out of the hospital. There are going to be penalties for readmissions and possible avoidable ER admissions, and mergers and acquisitions are continuing at an unprecedented rate within the healthcare industry. It's constant, constant change, and it will give you opportunities if you're organization 
is change adaptive. Bottom line trends for us um, through all these changes is to continue to improve access so that people have access to primary health care in particular and through that primary care have access to more tertiary services, increase patient satisfaction, improve quality and safety, and reduce expenses. This is what we have to have as our target because this is the, these are the trends that we're dealing with and this is what we need to address moving forward. And by, the only way we can do that is being innovative. And one of the areas that we bring in being innovative is in telehealth. And with that, I will introduce Gene Bergner, uh, VP of Post-Acute Care Services, who will talk to you about what telehealth means and where we are in our journey. Thank you, Duane. Um, just a couple housekeeping um, comments before I start. I want you all to know that not everyone did their undergraduate work at UW-Eau Claire. I did mine at UW-Stevens Point. And I also did my freshman year here at UWMC. So an alumni here before you. The other thing I want to quickly also acknowledge are two of my colleagues who are in the audience today so that you may have the opportunity to ask them questions or myself as well. First, Maria Gulan, who is our Vice President of Aspires Clinics and is my partner in leadership of the Telehealth Project, and also Kate Bergner, who is our Grant Manager in the Aspires Foundation. Going from there, um, a couple of vocabulary. Telehealth at Aspirus is like the umbrella. I need to use my hands. The umbrella goes like this. We call that whole umbrella telehealth. The ribs that come from that umbrella are telemedicine, patient to physician visit, telemonitoring, remote vitals monitoring of things like blood pressure, O2 sats, um, weight that comes remotely back to Aspirus. Um, also, telepsychiatry, teledermatology, and another new word that we all look at now is M Health. And when Dick pulled his iPhone, his smartphone, out of his pocket, we're going to be expected to communicate between patient and physician utilizing telephones and smartphone technology. So let's go with um, the slides that I have prepared for you today. Why do we need telehealth? It's not just a dream of Aspirus, it's a dream of, a, of the United States government, looking at we have a huge shortage of clinicians in this country, and particularly in rural areas. You listen to Duane say, well, who do we serve? We serve a lot of rural America in the Aspirus system. Also, we have the misdistribution of those clinicians. We have a lot of specialty physicians here in Wausau, but we have very limited um, specialty physicians in Houghton or in Ironwood, how do we bring that, those physicians to those areas easily? An aging population, CDC decided to call it the tsunami of aging, and I could tell you how old I am, but I'm one of those baby boomers too, and we have a huge number of seniors growing old. If you looked at the um, Wisconsin maps prepared by the, uh, the Department of Health in Madison, Ruthen County has an aging population of 38% coming in the next 10 years. It's huge. Delayed treatment, language barriers, clinical education programs, and all of it is to move people and make us a virtual system. Um, let me see. This little thing's going to move for me. Reduces barriers to access. Number one reason why we want to have virtual health. What is available in Wasa should be available in Ontonagan. Education that happens in the Kiwana should be available in Medford. So it gives us all of the benefits with regards to increase access and efficiency of providers. When you ask a, a clinical specialist to travel from Wasa to Ironwood and that day he or she, they're only seeing seven or ten patients they're really, and plus the eight hours of travel, you need to create the efficiency that healthcare reform is going to expect from us. Reducing overall healthcare costs, that too is very important. Delays in care. We look at the opportunity when we um, add telehealth to emergency departments where you can have the snowmobiler who is in Ontonagon and has sustained an injury to be seen by the specialist immediately 
by utilizing telehealth equipment. Increases patient satisfaction. Um, seniors uh, certainly, tend, many of us tend to live in northern Wisconsin. I know that's where I hope my husband and I will retire to. But then the opportunity when I need to see my physician, will I want to drive all the way to Wausau or another location um, for, for services? So being able to increase um, patient satisfaction by very quickly having access to care. Improves quality, improves health outcomes, and that, again, that virtual accessibility. Federal support of telehealth, and again, I need to emphasize that what is making telehealth possible in the United States are the, the stimulus dollars that are coming from the federal government. Federal project funding, Medicare reimbursement. This is important to know, especially as we see the tsunami of aging. Medicare will pay for telehealth visits, and that is really important to health care as well. <coughs> Direct care to federal populations, and I'll define those federal populations um, for you in just a minute. Federal funding comes from grants, contracts, and earmarks. Approximately 500 to 600 million dollars per year is coming from the federal government for projects. There's a pretty long list right here of all of the different um, federal projects or federal agencies you can go to to access funding for telehealth. I highlighted the distance learning and telemedicine grant program through the United States Department of Agriculture, and this is actually if you recall hearing about the grant that Aspirus was awarded for about a half million dollars came from. Medicare reimbursement, again, imaging, teleradiology, telepathology, telecardiology, remote patient monitoring. Um, again, I can't tell you how important it became to Aspirus VNA. As Duane was saying, we service about, um, we drive about a million miles a year in providing care in 16 counties in Wisconsin and six counties in the Western UP. I like to call it the Goldilocks syndrome. It's got to be just right. You don't want to go too soon to the patient and not too late. You want to go there right on time. And if you know the vital signs of that patient on a daily basis, you can be there when you need to be there and not a wasted visit or not a too light of a visit. We implemented telemonitoring in the VNA about six years ago, and it's been very, very successful. Oops, I think I went back. Well, let's look at this slide. There's one missing that I have on my script. I think this picture says it all. It's the screen, a computer screen, but with a physician or a provider um, reaching out with that stethoscope to the patient. Um, this is just a little summary of the grant that Aspirus received. Important for you to note that this was a, a matching grant, so not only did the federal government put dollars into this project at Aspirus, but Aspirus had to match those grant dollars as well. Current telehealth initiatives. Aspirus Connect is um, a new project at Aspirus. We have laptops available at our reception desk for families to utilize. I, I'd like to say that all of our daughters, our sons and daughters, when we're patients in the hospital, don't live in Wassa. Some of them live in San Francisco. Some of them live in New York. And to be able to be connected um, through Skype is a nice opportunity. So there are laptops at our desk where you can um, just borrow them from Aspirus and Skype with your son or daughter or any other family member as well um, a distance away. Epic, my Aspirus, um, again, this is the opportunity for patients to be able to look at their chart and is a major project in the Aspirus clinics. Link to Caring Bridge, again, allowing patients and families and friends to have a connection and an update reporting of how the patient is doing. Telemonitoring, which I described to you, um, is, has been available at Aspirus for the last six years. We have just completed a project at Aspirus with, with regards to heart failure and the readmission of heart failure patients and found every patient that we used telemonitoring on, we were able to manage that patient to stay at home versus being readmitted within 30 days. This is a new measurement window the federal government is putting into place in January of 2012. Teleconferencing. 
the opportunity also to not be, um, not to have the staff travel from place to place, <coughs> be able to conference with video conferencing is very, very important, saving great deals of time, but giving people access to that education. The NICU CAM, again, for patients who, um, who the littlest of our patients in our NICU, it can be seen by parents at home and any time, night or day. Telepsychiatry, um, there is a shortage of psychiatry, psychiatrists in Wisconsin, and the opportunity to have a psychiatrist who is actually in Appleton or Chicago be able to see patients in rural Wisconsin is, is really a huge benefit. This is just a, to give you a picture of the equipment. Um, the larger piece of equipment on your left is what we refer to as a physician on wheels. Um, it gives the opportunity for the patient who is going to be able to see the physician off of those um, screens. And then some of the other uh, smaller pieces of equipment are peripherals. We had brought some of the equipment into Aspirus um, for our providers to look at and one of the um, one of the most moments that day that made me smile was seeing one of our cardiologists jump up on the table and the other cardiologist taking the camera and saying, now can I see your carotid? And of course, and he could, and he said, I can see it better on the screen than I could see it in person. Just to give you a little visual, at Aspirus we look at telehealth as patient to, patient to physician as a major component of our program. Physician to physician as well. Know that um, in more of our more rural areas, we have many, many primary care physicians. But to have that primary care physician, when they have questions and the opportunity to collaborate with a primary care, with a specialty care physician, is really a huge advantage. And then, of course, education. We do have a clip that I thought you might want to see, which is actually a visit between a patient and his physician. Veteran Bill Jacobs is enjoying retirement on his ranch in Craig, Colorado. We're very fortunate here. We live in a rural area. We have the wildlife all the way around us. It's a beautiful setting. We love it. It's, uh, it's our lifestyle. But the closest VA hospital is more than 150 miles away, and getting there over mountain roads can be a real challenge. It's about a three and a half to four and a half hour drive to Grand Junction. In the past, we, uh, we missed a lot of our appointments. We couldn't make it down because of the storms. But now, telehealth is helping vets like Bill get the care they need closer to home. Uh, my name is Bart Taylor. I'm a PA with the VA Medical Center in Grand Junction. One of our patients is Bill Jacobs. He used to not really receive much care at all until the Craig Telehealth did open. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? Doing fine, sir. How are you? Excellent. Doing, doing good. Physical exams rely heavily on nursing at the remote site. The tools I have are a stethoscope, which is done over the web. Also, there are fiber optic otoscopes, and there is a high-definition uh, movable camera, which can be moved around to inspect skin lesions. Being examined on the, on the television screen is a little bit different than sitting in the office with that doctor. But on the other hand, he still is able to talk to you, to look at what your problems are, and you also are looking the other way at the doctor. I was surprised that uh, uh, you could provide this much level of care, and I think the veterans are actually more uh, satisfied with their care through telehealth. Yeah, our primary health care has, has definitely improved since the clinic came in and the people that are in there are well qualified people. They do a fantastic job. It's just an improvement for all of us veterans. The VA cannot continue to build large medical centers in every city. Uh, the answer to that is probably telehealth in that we can have a, a small clinic, a nurse or two, a computer link which would link to any doc or PA in America. This works very efficiently and very cost effectively. But it's just made our life so much easier out here. And it's utilized by veterans out of Utah, out of Wyoming, uh, and of course from this corner of, of Colorado here. I'm able to live here and actually drive 15 minutes and be into the health clinic to get the help that I need. So it's a godsend for us. You couldn't ask for any more. I have the better of two worlds. Okay. 
also um, would like to introduce you, he is not here, but we have an interview with Dr. Paul Lutmer, who's one of the cardiologists at Aspirus Cardiovascular Associates. I want to make sure I say thank you to Chris back there in the back room, because he's loading all of these clips for us. It's become much more useful just recently with the advent of very high speed internet connections, uh, which everybody is enjoying uh, streaming uh, their Netflix movies. Uh, that technology allows us to transfer a lot more data. So now we can transmit echocardiographic images, uh, very high resolution images of patients. A discussion through these uh, pieces of equipment feels much more natural uh, happening in real time. So it's really the quality of the equipment, uh, the reduction in cost of the equipment, and uh, um, the ability to transfer a lot of data, along with a lot of pressure to reduce healthcare uh, expenditures at a time when there's more and more people with chronic diseases that need care on a regular basis. I think that's the real potential of telehealth. Uh, not just the clinic visit system, which is one important part of that, uh, but also systems that are really telehealth that allow patients to be better at managing their medications and taking them at time, at, at communicating back and forth with the physician's office. Uh, there are systems that can monitor patients' weights. And by keeping track of all these things, which we can do very inexpensively uh, through the use of telehealth devices and computers, uh, we should be able to make day-to-day -day adjustments in patients' medical care uh, that should be able to let them be more active, feel better, and stay out of the hospital. And in the long term, there should be significant savings in, in doing that. It's going to require us to be very flexible. Uh, our, our days as physicians aren't going to be anything like uh, what we thought they would be when we headed off to medical school. Uh, but I think uh, physicians can be flexible. and. Uh, I think we can uh, accrue really large savings uh, by taking advantage of the, of the capabilities of these technologies. Well, we cover a very large geographic area uh, all the way up to uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, four hours away. And uh, many of these patients uh, don't get sick on a schedule. Uh, and uh, while we spend a lot of time driving to all these communities to see the patients in their own communities, uh, and patients come down a long ways to have their procedure done, it frequently happens that they get sick and they need to be seen at a time when we're not there or the cardiologist that is there is not the cardiologist that saw them the last time. So basically it removes a huge geographic barrier for patients who often don't feel all that well and, and the traveling is a real hardship. Absolutely, and it's beneficial for us to see patients in their own environment. You learn something about a community, and that really does help you take care of a patient living there. Uh, this is not intended to keep us from ever going and visiting these towns. We would continue to do our outreach on uh, the schedule that we currently have. This is really a supplemental thing, and uh, so if it's a routine thing that can be scheduled for a day, I'm going to be there we would still do it in person. But when somebody I've seen before suddenly has a problem that comes up, now I can be available on a daily basis. It really doesn't matter where I'm at that day. I'm available by telehealth at the time that the patient has a problem. So this is really a way of supplementing in-person visits. If you want to know more, um, Google telemedicine or telehealth. The, Aspire, the um, American Telehealth Association is very active and alive. Um, the only other thing in ending the objectives, of course, for Aspirus were to extend specialty services to the underserved populations, offering new services through affiliate partnerships, increasing physician efficiencies, improving quality of life, education opportunities, and financial savings.
Now, Dwayne, did you have how far this will take us? Get any final comments? Thanks, Gene. Just just to wrap it up, in terms of how far will this take us, we don't know. Telehealth is really at the early stages in its product life cycle. Uh, the Ont Ontario Telehealth Network is probably one of the largest providers of telehealth um, internationally. They currently have 1,100 sites for telehealth outlets. They see 160,000 this last year, 160,000 patient visits by a telehealth. It sounds like a lot, except they have 70 million patient visits on face-to-face. -face. Um, so the opportunity for growth for this is tremendous. I see local, regional, global applications for uh, correctional institutions, for schools, for school nursing programs, uh, wellness clinics within respective corporations, for snowbirds who travel south in the, in the winter and need to connect with their physician up in the, in the north woods. Um, lots of opportunity. So hopefully this has been beneficial and we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That, was, uh, that was really interesting. As, an, as a former, I was going to say old, as a former uh, insurance guy, uh, involved in uh, negotiating contracts with providers and talking about reimbursements. Uh, this adds a whole new dimension to the, uh, the reimbursement schedules.